Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of uh, having Eric Jimenez give us a talk. Uh, Eric completed his doctorate at uh, the University of Bonn and at uh, the Impress, uh, under the Impress program under Frank Bertholdi, uh, Benjamin McNelly, and Alex Green. In his thesis, he used uh, VLA observations to determine the size of global star forming components of galaxies. After a postdoc at the uh, NRAO, he has been at area since last year. Eric works on the formation of galaxies and in probing the role of black hole activity and star formation in their evolution. Today, he's going to tell us about the evolution of uh, structure and star forming galaxies at intermediate redshifts using VLA and ALMA observations. Let's welcome him. Uh, I just want to remind everyone in the auditorium, please turn off your cell phones and everyone on Zoom, please turn off your cameras and microphones for now. I think one of these is going to wait a moment because- uh, I, I, Oh yeah, I'm going to, yeah, as soon as, as soon as this happens, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for the very nice introduction. Um, voy a dar la, la plática en inglés porque tenemos unos angloparlantes en la audiencia, pero especialmente los estudiantes si tienen preguntas, siéntanse libres en hacerlas en español o en español. Aquí pueden ser un poco muchos. So, now I'm switching to English. Um, yeah, today's topic is the interpretive evolution of uh, massive star forming galaxies at intermediate redshift. So, I was telling uh, Ramadi before. Uh, this talk that thanks to GMLCT, these are now intermediate reaches because now you're just, is finding things at high reaches. Um, so the, the main objective of this type of studies is to uh, gather observational evidence on uh, the physical mechanisms that regulate the growth of galaxies throughout cosmic time. Um, there are many people um, involved, especially my former PSC advisor, Benjamin Magnelli. Also, well, you may know this guy, Eric Murphy. And um, I would like to highlight a contribution from two young researchers like you, a PhD student San Ming Wang from the University of Hall and Krista de Corsi from the University of Arizona. So, so uh, I would like to uh, apologize in advance with the extragalactic people because uh, I'm gonna start with a very basic introduction to uh, galaxy evolution. So please bear with me. Uh, then I will focus on the results that we have obtained with the PLA surveys that allow us to study the extent and the formation in distant galaxies. After that, I will jump into the ALMA studies that allow us to, explo to explore the content of molecular gas in distant galaxies. And after that, we will combine the information that we get from these two points so that we can get some uh, first insights um, on the star forming cycle in distant galaxies. And finally, I will highlight the open issues and the ongoing efforts to tackle those issues. Uh, I have some acronyms here, which will be presented in the entire presentation. So, a staff formation rate, SFG, a staff forming galaxy, and MS mean sequence. So, let's start with this nice picture of the Hubble Ultra D field that, uh, well, it reveals thousands of distant galaxies, and we have a bus two of them. Uh, galaxies going from redshift, uh, now no redshift 0 0.7 to uh, redshift close to 10, which corresponds to an epoch when the universe was a few mega years uh, old. And it is evident here that you can see uh, a difference in the morphological or structural properties of galaxies. And the fundamental question is how uh, we can go from this fuzzy, irregular, faint, and uh, small things to very complex uh, mature systems like the galaxies that we observe in the present epoch. So thanks to the uh, improved sensitivity of telescopes, including now the GWHSP and others, we are now going deeper and deeper in the sky. So we are proving earlier cosmic epochs. So we are building um, a general picture of galaxy evolution. So in general, we know that galaxies form within the first billion years after the Big Bang, and then they continue to grow throughout the remaining 12 giga years of cosmic history. But now the question is that um, we would like to know the exact physical mechanism that regulated the production of stars and consequently the growth of galaxies um, in the universe. And that's the general open issue that we'll be discussing today. As a uh, proud astronomer, you know, what we do when we face a problem is we classify things. And it turns out that in 2007, these um, uh, people, El David de Vaz 
and many others found that galaxies, most galaxies correlate in the star formation rate, the stellar mass plane. This is the so-called main sequence of galaxies or main sequence star forming galaxies. Uh, we have therefore galaxies that are forming stars at a higher rate than expected. These are known as the Star Wars. And we also have some um, galaxies that are not producing too many stars. So these are old and quiescent galaxies. And for this talk, I will only focus on the Star Wars and main sequence galaxy populations. Here you can see two examples of what we observe in the local universe. We have a Star Wars and a main sequence galaxies. And directly from these images, you can see that the structural properties of these galaxy populations are quite different. So Star Wars are uh, compact and perturbed systems, while main sequence galaxies in general are uh, well-designed spiral galaxies. Okay, so this type of observations uh, led to several authors to suggest that these two galaxy populations actually represent a different stage in the life of a galaxy. So the consensus is that galaxies on the main sequence grow as they accrete gas from the cosmic web until you have, uh, I mean, and they evolve along the main sequence until you have these occasional gas rich mergers that apparently enhance the star formation rate and bring the galaxy into the Star Wars territory. Eventually, the gas this can reform, and then the galaxy will continue to grow along the main sequence until at some point the gas is depleted. So there are no more gas to form a star. And then you end up with an old and quiescent galaxy. And thanks to observations in the local universe, we know that this scenario is valid, generally valid for galaxies in the local universe. So we have these Eulers and we have these sequence galaxies. The question in this talk is if this valid is uh, remains valid for galaxies in the distant universe. And this is particularly important because uh, in recent, well, in the past decade, it, is, uh, it has become clear that the galaxies in the early universe were producing uh, order of magnitude smaller stars than in the present. Here you can see the star formation rate as a function of the stellar mass or main sequence plane for galaxies at different uh, epochs or redshifts. And let's focus uh, on galaxies at redshift two, those are like uh, magenta here. So compared to the star formation rate of the Milky Way, so these galaxies, early galaxies are forming uh, 10 times more stars, even more. And the question is why? Is this because based on what we know in the local universe is because all the galaxies in the distant universe are driven by mergers or it is because they have more gas or somehow a higher star formation efficiency, right? So that's the motivation. We investigate if the mechanisms driving the intense production of stars in the early universe are similar or not to what we know in the nearby and local universe. Uh, to tackle this question, we look at the structure of galaxies because the structure of galaxies encapsulates uh, key information on the mechanisms that shape galaxies. No? So what we do in general is to relate the amount of star forming material, molecular gas per unit area, with the amount of stars that are being producing within the same, same region. So this is the gas surface density and the star formation rate surface density. Uh, if we combine these two quantities, we get what is called the Kennedy of the Schmidt plane. In the y-axis, we have star formation rate surface density, and in the x-axis, gas surface density. And again, we rely on observations in the local universe, and what we find is that galaxies on the main sequence and Star Wars galaxies occupy different regimes in the stuff and the chemical display plane. So because the Star Wars are compact and the uh, systems with extreme star formation rates, they lie in the top right end of the chemical Smith plane, while main sequence galaxies, because they have uh, they host a widespread star formation activity and they have a lower star formation rate, they lie in the bottom left end of the chemical the Schmidt plane. Uh, the final idea here is to use the chemical the Schmidt plane as a diagnostic, and I would like to stress this as a diagnostic only, to uh, infer the mechanisms, the dominant mechanisms regulating the production of stars in the distant universe. The problem is that measuring the extent of the structure of galaxies in the distant universe is challenging, and this is why measurements of the chemical the Schmidt plane at high redshift have been limited to a few hundreds 
of these 10 galaxies. So here's an example of you, what you can get um, when you observe galaxies in the distant universe. Yeah, I know. Like, uh, but yeah, it, it is what it is. So this is a real survey. Um, the, I, I, will, I will describe this survey later. Um, yeah, this is what you get. Even with the ELA and ALMA, which are supposed to be, which I believe they are, the most powerful radio interferometers in the world, galaxies at the range larger than one, they look generally like this, just blow. And it's funny because uh, Baran Shabushan, my former master advisor, he was always mocking the high range guys. That's a uh, like you do blow, blow, you know, I, and I ended up doing this. Um, by the way, and yeah, also Jim Condor once said that there is nothing as useless as a single radio source. Because what would you do with a radio source like that? I mean, you measure the flux density, maybe the size, you know, and that's it. Uh, so instead of looking or, or studying galaxy evolution on a source by source basis, what we generally do is uh, we use radio service or service in other frequency so that we can assemble a large compilation of galaxies and we study galaxy evolution on a statistical basis. So what we do is we identify a compare correlation between the physical properties of the galaxies, and then we make some, you know, educated guesses about what is happening. Um, okay, I think that this is a, a very simple slide, but I would like to remind you how we estimate star formation rates. And for this particular talk, uh, we focus on the UV emission. Here is a uh, image of May 51, of course, this is a nearby galaxy. Um, but here is just to show you that when you use UV emission, you are affected by dose occupation. You know? In order to compensate or to uh, consider the contribution of a star formation activity that is obscured by dose, we use radio continuum emission that is tracing non thermal or synchrotron emission from supernova remnants tracing the end of massive and young stars. So we combine these two quantities, ultraviolet and radio, and we get the total star formation rate. Now, what about the molecular gas? Of course, we can use CO emission, but it turns out that when you try to detect CO at high rates, as we will see later, it's a nightmare. So it's a very faint, or they are very faint lines. No? And of course, you have the cold dose emission, so that's the standard approach to uh, obtain images in the simulator millimeter regime. And then we estimate the dust mass of distant galaxies. And we use the gas to dust ratio. And then we can infer the gas of distant galaxies. OK, now after this general introduction, let's jump into the type of things that we can do with the ELA and explore the uh, structural properties of galaxies in the radio regime. And let me start with the data sets that we're using. So, First, we have the VLA Cosmos Survey at 3 gigahertz. Uh, uh, I mean, this is still one of the largest and deeper radio continuum surveys today because it covers the two square degrees of the Cosmosphere. So you can see the comparison with the Moon. Um, it gets a resolution of a uh, super second resolution of 0.75 seconds and RMS of 2.3 microns per beam. For those who are non radio astronomers, this means nothing, but it's deep, it's deep you know? Um, the Hubble Frontier Field is a program where you target uh, massive galaxy clusters and you leverage the power of gravitational lensing to detect galaxies that are in the background that are very faint or are very distant, uh, or, or very distant galaxies. Uh, here we have a slightly better resolution and we are going deeper, one microjansky per beam and two different frequencies. Uh, well, we get uh, around, well, combine it, uh, 13,000 sources at high redshift. The first key result that we obtained from this uh, data set is that we can investigate the growth history of galaxies, so in fancy words, in, in you know, more human words, what we are doing is measuring the size of galaxies at different cosmic epochs and see if there is a trend. Here I'm showing you the effective radius as a function of redshift for uh, massive galaxies. What I'm calling massive galaxies are those that have a stellar mass larger than 10 to the 10 solar masses. And we have the optical, UV, and radio into essentially one uh, frequency. And immediately from this plot, what you can see is that uh, radio, UV, and optical size, they, they appear to, to grow by a factor of 1.5 to 2 from is the, the highest ratio that you have at this three to a uh, ratio of zero. Well, this is expected because you are expecting to that galaxies will grow throughout cosmic time. 
The other interesting thing that we find is that the size as observed in the optical, mainly the optical that we take as a proxy for the stellar mass distribution, G size is three, two times more extended, or larger, sorry, than the size that we measure in the radio that is facing the star formation, which suggests that uh, galaxies over the past 10, gig year, 10 giga years costed uh, centrally enhanced the star formation activity that probably contributed to the growth of a galactic bulge. Mm -hmm. But we uh, recent studies suggest that eh, um, all the forces it might it, this might be due to dust obscuration. Um, the second key result from these studies is that we are able to link a star formation rate with the structural changes uh, of galaxies as observed in the radio regime. In other words, what we are doing is we compare the effective radius in the radio as a function of excess of star formation for those who are galactic people. So this is distance to the mean sequence. Uh, essentially high values of excess of star formation, then you have a high star formation rate per stellar mass. Uh, mean sequence galaxies have an excess of star formation of zero because they are normal mean sequence galaxies. And you can see the same thing for different redshift beams going from 0 0.3 to redshift 2.2. And the first result, well, the first trend that we observe here is that galaxies on the main sequence are preferentially extended, while galaxies above the main sequence are always compact system. All right, let's go back to uh, what I mentioned earlier about the local universe. And you may remember that I said that galaxies in the local universe that are on the main sequence are preferentially extended, and galaxies above the main sequence or standard galaxies are compact. Well, this suggests that the same thing is happening um, over the last 10 giga years of cosmic history. Eric, yeah, sorry, I uh, forgot the previous. Uh, you mean that the, are they extended or there is a variety of sizes? Ah, in here the is a variety of sizes uh, in the mean sequence. Yeah, the, the, the size ranges. Exactly, yeah. So not all the main sequence are Big. extended. Mm -hmm. Some of them are compact, but the vast majority are extended. So those like we can ask uh, questions. Yeah. So are these sizes uh, measured down to say the, the size down to the sensitivity level, or do you make the typical Gaussian fitting of the old fashioned globular? Globular, yes, not so much. Yes, we fit the two Gaussian profile uh, on the, the map. We try to do this in the UV plane for those who are astronomers, not what I'm talking about. But in the UV plane, what you get is just now. We are not much larger than the UV plane. No, it's just like uh, very resolved, that's what we call it. And to make sure that we were measuring things right, I spent two years of my life running <laughs> Monte Carlo simulations to know what are the systematic biases that we were introducing when measuring a Yeah, the, sure. Is the uh, systematic bias and the uncertainty in the logs as you go in high redshift, is that taken into account in these? Uh... Yeah, yes, yes. And we can. We can have a call with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they are taking it account. It, it's sad because when I was preparing this talk and you know this previous talk, you know, like why am I not presenting any of the plots that you know it took me two years to prepare? And I'm showing the last thing, but you know, this is science. Uh, okay, so now to summarize the two things that I was mentioning before. Uh, this type of observation are supporting the, the an emerging consensus on the structural evolution of uh, uh, of massive galaxies, and this has been what is being constructed via numerical simulation and observational results like this. So, in order to explain this, I will use this diagram. Credits go to Sandro Tachela and I forgot the first name and Lapiner uh, recently. That published a paper in this year. So here we have excess of star formation as a function of stellar mass. And as I mentioned at the beginning, galaxies on the main sequence are expected to grow as they accrete gas from the cosmic web until occasional mergers or the strong inflows of gas uh, 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 increase the central gas surface density and trigger a compact star. So now they, they, they call it compaction event. So I'm following that. Um, Definition. And uh, once the, the, the gas is depleted, you know, when the ga galaxy consumes the available gas reservoir, then the galaxy will reduce the star formation rate. So it will fall here. 
And then if you have another event of gas compaction, compactation, and uh, then you will have another uh, burst of star formation of the compact. But at some point, the replenishing time, so the replenish time is the time that will take the galaxy to replenish its current gas reservoir. If that time is larger than the depletion time, then the galaxy will not be able to form more stars. And that's when the galaxy will start to quench, will not produce more stars, to have more gas. And if you have an AGN, this is something that I was studying also in parallel, but I will not focus on that now. Uh, then that will also contribute to the quenching of a galaxy. Uh, so if we look, and this looks like a fancy, a cartoon, but if we look at the ugly results, you know, we see some indications of that here. So we have an extent of the star formation as a function of the star formation. Once you have a higher star formation rate, you see this compaction, what they call. And we also find evidence, this is related to what uh, it was asked before, that we also find evidence of some mean sequence galaxies that are compact, but are not, uh, because under the mean sequence, they are not having high star formation rates, which we believe could be representative to the galaxies here that are compact, but are not uh, forming stars at a high rate. Okay, so that's uh, for the structural properties that we explore in the radio. Now let's jump into the content of molecular gas that we can explore with ALMA. So this is a bit different because contrary to the VLA where you can take the telescope and point in a particular area in the sky and you get, for example, here this is the cosmos field, I'm sorry, the cosmos field and uh, with the VLA your pointing covers at 3 gigahertz around 15, 15 arc minutes. On the contrary, with ALMA at around 300 gigahertz, you get a field of view of around uh, 18 seconds or something like that. So here you can see the comparison. All of these are ALMA pointings, and this is the VLA pointings. So we need to take a different approach. And what we do is look at the ALMA archive. So we take a look at all the archival observations. So we hold the historical observations in the ALMA archive. <laughs> and we exploit it, you know? so we mine it. So that's the goal of the A3 Cosmos that um, was initiated in Bonn uh, with Brian Bertoldi, um, because uh, we use the German, the facilities of the German Almar Regional Center, the Art German, German Art North. Um, I would like to highlight again the work of Daishan Liu and uh, San Ming Wang, because they have been leading these efforts during the past years. I will not go into the details about how boring is to process the VLA, the ALMA archive, but I will jump directly into the results. So using these archival observations, we uh, use the dust continuum observations and the zero emission observations and estimate the gas mass, um, the gas property, sorry, of around 1,000 galaxies in the cosmos field. Uh, the first result that we have here is the evolution of the molecular gas fraction, that is the amount of gas, the molecular gas that you have divided by the amount of stars that you have in a galaxy. And that as a function of redshift. And as you can see here, let's take again an example of redshift two. Uh, galaxies at those epochs were of hybrid, more than one order of magnitude uh, of gas, of molecular gas. And here what we have is the gas fraction now is a function of the stellar mass. And we find that the more massive galaxies have a lower gas fraction, but they cannot grow more. Um, OK, same thing, but now for um, distance to the mean sequence, so excess of star formation, or whatever you want to call it, so higher star formation rate per stellar mass. And we find that a fixed redshift and stellar mass, galaxies with a higher star formation rate exceed higher gas fraction, which I mean, it's kind of expected if you are forming a lot of stars, somehow you need to have a lot of star forming material. But we quantify that. Uh, and the final key result is the evolution of the gas emission time scale uh, across, you know, as a function of red or, or cosmic epoch. Uh, again, gas emission time scale is the time that takes the galaxy to consume its current gas reservoir. And what we find is that there are some indications of uh, uh, this trend where galaxies at higher redshift converted this, the gas into stars more rapidly so that 
This implies that galaxies at high redshift had a higher star formation efficiency. Okay, uh, I would like to mention that I don't like to show questions, but if you're interested in the uh, quant I mean the relations, scaling relations that were driving the equations themselves, you can use the Python package HT Cosmos gas evolution that you can find here. Um, and I shall put all these together. So it's a great resource because then you can find you can find all the relations that are shown here and many others. I have a very yeah, sure. general question. Uh, is the evolution of this the XCO factor taken into account? Yes. <laughs> uh, that depends on metallicity. <laughs> yeah. So that all of those scaling relations can be used here. There's an appendix uh, in, in one of those papers that describes all those scaling relations. Yes, I would like to study this paper for the students. We don't have all this information like local people. So what we are doing is we infer that they follow a scaling relations similar to the uh, that we see in the local view. No, and we extrapolate those. Of course, we don't know if that's true, but that's something that I will discuss later. Um, okay, now that we have all this information about the star formation rate and the gas content in galaxies and some insights on the structural properties of these galaxies. We can uh, explore some things about the star forming cycle in distant galaxies. And I think that what we can do is going from the general, the very general thing to the particular things. And the very general thing that we can do is to uh, explore the cosmic star formation rate density as a function of uh, cosmic age or redshift. Uh, what we do is we quantify the number of stars that are being produced per year per commodity volume of the universe, and we plot that as a function of redshift. We plot here uh, all the data points from different star formation based indicators, mainly from uh, the radio regime. And you can see that uh, there is a peculiar shape where this uh, cosmic star formation rate density peaks at redshift around two. And this is the model plot that we were discussing over the launch with René and others. And you can see this is steepening at higher and lower ranges. So at higher ranges, we have this steepening because we don't have too many galaxies uh, that are forming stars. And the steepening at lower ranges is because once you form a lot of the stars, then you don't have more gas to, to form more new stars. Now, what happened when we try to constrain the same thing, but now for the molecular gas? This is uh, something that we were discussing also, it's funny, because this is the cosmic molecular gas density, it's the same thing, molecular gas mass per volume, volume unit in the universe as a function of redshift. And I, and I was joking that when I first saw this plot, it was the first one came from Roberto De Carli in 2016, I was in a conference saying, what is that? I mean, you can see the huge error bars, but at least it gives you some constraints on the evolution. And uh, with time, I mean, that was one of the motivations of ALMA, no? And with time, more data came in, and uh, we were able to constrain, to better constrain this shape. So now we are reducing the error bars. And what is clear here is that, hmm, well, it looks roughly similar, no? So it also picks at redshift too, and you have this steepening. What is it telling you is that, yeah, it seems that across, well, throughout the cosmic history of the universe, the molecular gas has been key to regulate the production of star. In, in, in galaxies, not only distance, in all galaxies. And again, you see, you say that, okay, this is expected, no? But uh, in 2005, this was not entirely expected. One of the key alma science requirements in 2005 was to put attention in this work, normal galaxy like the Milky Way at Redshift 3. Now, what is a normal galaxy at Redshift 3? <laughs> well, those monsters are forming stars at a higher, um, at 10 times higher rates, and also they have 10 times more gas, at least. So this was not expected to, in 2005, and this makes me wonder what would happen in the next 15 years with NGBLA and many others, uh, and I will discuss that later. Okay, now we can go into the more particular things, because we have a stellar, a star formation rates and molecular gas mass, and also some insights of the extent of galaxies, and we can place them in the Kennedy of the Schmidt plane. So here you see uh, information from around 2,000 star-forming galaxies at redshift 0.3 to 2. 
Um, I will take a bit of time to describe this plot because I think that it summarizes the key message of, of this, this talk. What you can see in these challenge regions are different regimes of the staff emission efficiency. Here you can see the depletion time scale line of one giga year. So if one galaxy falls in this region, then it will take one giga year to consume the gas. And if you have a galaxy falling here, when you have a gas depletion, then uh, gas depletion time of 10 mega years, then this will be a highly efficient uh, galaxy in terms of forming stars. Uh, the data points shows in red the average location of main sequence thermal galaxies. And you can see that uh, we can use a single, uh, well, just like five data points, but still, uh, we can use a single relation to fit to describe this data. And it has a superlinear slope of 1.5. So there are two things that uh, we can say about this, the, the, this correlation. First, it tells us that the molecular the star formation relation holds a high redshift, so similar relation at low and high redshift. But because we have a super linear slope, you are uh, more efficient at forming stars in the early universe. So you look at the uh, location of this data point at redshift two, where you can see that the gas efficient time scale was around 500 mega years. And if you go to those, towards lower redshifts, it goes closer to one giga years, so like in the present epoch. Uh, now focusing on the Star Wars population, well, this seems to be an extrapolated version. Uh, there is a lot of discussion, and this is something I was talking with Javier. But uh, well, at least here, it seems to follow uh, the relation that we that describe the population of Michigan galaxies. But of course, the Star Wars are forming, well, they have a lot of uh, gas, also uh, gas surface density, and also have a higher star formation efficiency. So these are crazy guys. Now let's go back to our initial people. Yeah. We understand well if we say that uh, starbursts are the same at progression. Yeah, they hold, I mean, they, they populate the chemical Smith plane roughly in the same place. They cannot go above because then you have the rent unlimited. But yeah, that's something that we, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for clarifying. So let's go back to our initial plot. Uh, this is the plot from Emmanuel Edad in 2010, where I show you that in the local universe, we have this clear dichotomy where you have Ulix populating this part and main sequence of spiral galaxies populating this, the, this part of the chemical Smith plane. So similar to what we observe in the nearby universe, a high redshift, again, we see this dichotomy in the physical, in the chemical Smith plane of these two galaxy population. So this suggests that the processes driving star formation uh, in sequence and galaxies and star wars, well, remain out of region too. The difference here is that galaxies on the main sequence, they have a higher gas surface density because they have more gas, therefore they are producing more stars. And they also have a higher star formation efficiency. And there's a lot of discussion why it's driving this, but this is something related with the kinematics of the galaxy. Uh, so coming to the initial claims, yes, so similar processes. So main sequence galaxies are regulated by the cosmological gas accretion. And then you have these Star Wars that still at which it seems to be driven by the galaxy measures and also by an or and or by an instability that drive gas into the center of galaxies. Uh, cool. I think that that's all, but now I'd like to focus on the open issues and now you can throw the tomatoes because you will see a lot of issues. And I think this is a healthy exercise to take a step back and think about the, how you are doing the right thing. No? Uh, let's start with the star formation rate calibrators that we use from the radio regime. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in the radio regime, we convert the star formation rate, uh, sorry, radio luminosity to star formation rates using the fine infrared radio correlation. So let's forget about this term. So infrared uh, proportional to the 1.4 gigahertz plus this parameter, the Q parameter. But it turns out that this parameter, the Q, um, FIR, depends on different things. One of them is redshift. There are some claims that it could also depend on the stellar mass and many other things. So in order to derive proper or robust star formation rate and values, we need to better calibrate this correlation. The second issue is that at high redshift, 
uh, when you try to estimate monochromatic luminosities, for example, the 1.4 gigahertz luminosity, you need to k-correct, no? Because you are not observing the same uh, regime of the SED. And what we do is simply assume the SED of a typical Star Wars galaxy. And we don't know if that holds true at the high redshift. And the final thing related to the structure, uh, I, I did this exercise of comparing the radio size as a function of observer frequency. This hasn't been published in any place, but I think it's interesting to see that uh, this is for galaxies at redshift one, two, so roughly the same cosmic epoch. And uh, it is clear that as you go towards uh, higher frequencies, then you start to see more compact galaxies, which hints at, at, at some issues with the cosmic differential ray diffusion. Uh, what we are doing to tackle some of those issues is, of course, like every astronomer, we need more data, uh, we need better data. So we need deep multi-frequency radio surveys at high angular resolutions. And we are focusing on three particular fields, uh, sorry, uh, that account for around 600 hours of ELA time. So the first one, this is the one that, <laughs> that I showed you at the beginning with the block. Um, this is the VLA 3 against mosaic of the cosmic evolution early release science survey uh, of the JWST in the extended God strip. Um, well, the PI is uh, Mark Dickinson, and I'm in charge of processing the data. Uh, the other surveys that we have is the VLA 10 gigahertz and 3 gigahertz mosaic of the goods north field, which some of you already know that is killing my nerves. Um, so the PIs is again Eric Murphy and myself, and I'm in charge of processing the whole thing. And also the VLA CGHX map of by 2744. That was one of the first uh, fields observed with the JWST. Um, thanks, God, but now Esteban Orozco will take care of that. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the issues that we have for the molecular gas. Uh, I mean, Every time we try to get decent observation of CO, a molecular gas in the distant universe, we, this is what we get. I mean, even with ALMA, the, I'm sorry, the far infrared emission that we use to convert gas mass, this is, <laughs> again, a bluff, no? Um, this is with ALMA using a reasonable integration time. With NOIMA, and these are extreme systems with the star formation rates of 1,000. With NOIMA, we can get these type of observations, again, barely resolved. And it took like five hours to get this. The thing is that once you get to, to more normal galaxies, no, because these are these two in the left, no, right, are extreme galaxies. But when you go and try to observe more typical mainstream galaxies in the distant universe, well, things become, become more complicated. With Noima, after 20 hours of observations, you get CO5 to 4. And well, yeah. And with BLA, you integrate 20 hours to get CO2 to one, and you get this, which is like signal to noise of 3.5 at the peak <laughs> and spy integrated, but trust me, there is a line there. So it's just illustrate how difficult it is to study molecular gas in the distant universe, right? So what we do, or well, what we are trying to do now is to focus on galaxies that are gravitationally massive. So we take advantage of uh, gravitational lens that magnify the light of galaxies that are at high reaches. And we can get this type of images. We have, well, this is optical. We don't really care about this, but for ALMA, this is the thing that we get. You can see the, the, the resolution that we have. So we can sample across different resolution elements uh, the galaxies at high reaches. This is an image of the VLA at six gigahertz. And we can even get a uh, line, CO line observations towards the system and reconstruct the, the south plane information. This is a rotating this at redshift to point two. So that's the next thing that we are trying to do. And hopefully in the next colloquium, uh, I will show some of these results related to VLA and ALMA. And now is the time to uh, anuncios parroquiales or you know, <laughs> informations. Uh, this is uh, about the AGVA. Uh, yeah, Roberto mentioned something about this during the last uh, colloquium, but I will again briefly summarize what is the NG, what the NGBLA would be. Um, so it would be the next thing in radio astronomy with the SKA 
it will have 10 times better sensitivity and, and resolution than uh, the DNA and ALMA. Uh, cover, we cover our wide frequency range, so the whole one to 100 gigahertz. And uh, it will have like uh, 263 antennas, hopefully some of them in Mexico. Um, and yeah, for this, I will just show what type of science we will be able to do uh, regarding the galaxy evolution key science goal of the group. Um, now, there are many things that NGBA can do for us related to, for example, uh, AGMs. But for this, I will only focus on the things that I discussed before, so star formation and CO maps. What you would have seen here is, uh, well, there are mock observations of, uh, of the ancient LA. So what we are doing, I'm doing, uh, is I take a model uh, of a nearby galaxy NGC, something I forgot uh, uh, the exact name. I convert the H alpha luminosity to star formation rate. I redshift this thing to 1.2. And then I use this as a more uh, oh, so as an input model, and I uh, get some mock observations with the VLA and the NGBLA using the same integration time, 20 hours of on-source um, integration time. This is what we get with the VLA, and actually it, it looks pretty similar to the galaxies that we are finding now. Not the first one that I showed that looks like a block, but the good snort 10 GHz because we have the best resolution now. That is also problematic, but. Yeah. Uh, that's for another talk. Um, and this is what we get for, for the NGBLA. You can see that there is a huge progress. No? We, we go from this fossil thing, uh, and with the NGBLA, we'll be able to see this parallels and even some bright stuff on the clouds. So these are the things that we can only get for galaxies in the nearby universe. Now, in terms of gas, I run, uh, well, we run now with Sawi because with uh, Deshika Narayanan and Eric Murphy and myself, we run some simulations of distant galaxies and how NGBLA will observe the CO emission. Here you can see um, the CO ladder, so CO1 to 0, CO2 to 2, blah, blah, blah. And because the different frequency coverage of NGBLA and ALMA, ALMA will preferentially trace the high JCO, so dense gas. And here, well, it emphasizes why we need NGBLA because the NGBLA will trace the low JCO that uh, trace the, traces the uh, bulk of the diffuse gas. And just, just a comparison, this is the image that I showed you that we spent 20 hours in the VLA and we got a five sigma detection, um, unresolved detection, and with the same amount of time, and this is even 10 times faint, uh, brighter. This one is 10 times uh, brighter. And with the same amount of time, this is the, the type of images that we will get for galaxies in the distant universe. And again, we will be able to prove uh, some uh, structures like spiral arms in the center and even some clumps. So in the end, combining the information from the star formation maps and CO maps from NGBLA, we will explore the star forming cycle at the, at the level of detail that uh, today is only possible for galaxies in the, in the local universe. And that's all I have to present. So let me summarize the take home messages. So we have seen that during the past 10 gigahertz years of cosmic history, or out to reach two to three, the structural properties of galaxies on the main sequence and star wars have been different. So these points were different modes of star formation. Uh, also, we have seen that the star formation rate between area and galaxies has declined at a rate that is correlated to the available gas reservoir. And the final thing, the information of a bright future that we will go from galactic average or blocks yeah. to spatially resolved observations with the NGBLA so that we will learn a lot of things uh, about the star formation and probably we can uh, even talk with uh, people that work on star formation in the nearby universe. And that's it. Yeah. So we'll start with questions in the auditorium first. In the meantime, uh, let's see some hands on Zoom as well. Uh, okay, Jacobo. Okay, Ricardo. Yeah, yeah you, you mentioned that um, high relative galaxies essentially show a higher efficiency of star formation. Yeah. So um, recently it has been proposed that maybe it's related with density or low metallicity, higher gas density and lower metallicity. 
but also you mentioned something related with kinematics. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah, the thing is that people propose it that, uh, uh, well, not propose it. It is not that the, the velocity dispersion in galactic is this is higher at higher ratio. And so one of the interpretations is that you have that because you have this halo of uh, these strings of cold gas supplying the disk, and this injects some turbulence that makes the disk more efficient in position mm -hmm. because it allows the disk to break into giant clumps and form stuff at a higher rate. Of course, I'm not an expert, so probably uh, Javier or Rizvike can, can, can also chime in if you want. Okay, okay. yeah. Uh, you have a sub with uh, from radio. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> aren't you concerned about possible information from EGM? Yeah, we went to uh, to all the exercise of uh, removing all the AGM. We, I mentioned another project, so to tackle the other project, we went, we're interested in AGM. So we had to uh, deselect those using different, you know, call, uh, optical colors. Uh, so you didn't be one of the AGMs. Yes, but only with the more the cleanest possible uh, sample of the star forming galaxies. So different. Mm -hmm. There is a paper by Bermesa in 2017 that she implemented a lot of. Uh, the uh, AGM diagnostics to, to remove those AGM that have a minimal indication that there is an AGM. Of course, uh, maybe we missed something, but uh... yeah. Okay, Robert. Uh, with all the radio surveys at different wavelengths, as you showed, do you plan to cross calibrate the low frequency calibration and the high frequency calibration? That, if I understand well, the, yeah. the low frequency is essentially synchronous. Yeah. Super on resolve supernovae, etc., and the high frequencies, very morbid calibration. Yeah, that is essentially H2 region. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yes, uh -huh. that 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 uh, one of the key motivations behind this ELA large program uh, to compare. I mean, if we are able to use the 10 gigahertz emission, the observer, but it's very very 30 gigahertz, which is pretty free now, but mainly pretty free. And if we are able to cross correlate that with the non-thermal calibrators and also with the other calibrators like the optical h alpha and the JWS system that will give us access to h alpha. So yeah, that's, we're excited about that, but we need to finish. We got the other one. Laura? It's actually a comment. Yeah. But uh, so so essentially the NGBLA will not be better than ALMA, right? You, you'll only be able to see a normal galaxy of the uh, yes and no. I mean, there are two things. The NGBL will give us access to the low JCO transitions, and it will have 10 times better resolution and sensitivity, which I think that this changes the whole game because what we get with 20 hours of observations is this is what we get currently with the ALMA, with ALMA, sorry. But ALMA will not give us access to this. So essentially, you will be tracing this and you forget about the spider labs. <laughs> uh, uh, let us say, I mean, we try to ask for 20 hours of service with Alma in one single source and they keep saying no. Oh. <laughs> okay. uh, bro? Yes. yes, I have a question about uh, how do you handle the precision of the calculation of redshift, uh, high redshift galaxy? Because I know that the further the galaxy is, it's harder to. Yeah, and the properties and redshift, well, is one of them. So how do you, or how can you be sure that that redshift is the one and not yes. it's closer? Or... Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because I don't remember the exact numbers, but out of it, well, we started with 3,000 and then we narrowed down to 2,000 because we wanted a mass complete sample. So for those, I would say that 50%, no, like 25% of them have a spectroscopic redshift or clearly a bit more. For the others, we have photometric regions, but photometric regions have an uncertainty of, uh, I don't remember, it was something like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, something like that. And they have a catastrophic rate of 1, 2%, which is like out of the 100 galaxies, one or two will have like a like messy redshift estimate. So yeah, I mean, that's a good question, but uh, even if we consider those, those things, and because we are measuring average properties of galaxies at different cosmic epochs, we are ready to be safe. Thank you. Okay. Hey, can you put your uh, can you see the relation? Sure, sure. So uh, there, okay, you have molecular gas there, right? Yes. 
Okay, is there an estimation of what would be the correlation if you put the total amount of gas? Yeah, or that's right. if the other question is uh, have somebody else is, have performed the, the history of the H1? Oh, mass? that's yeah, that's a good question. And I wanted to put a uh, backup slide. Still, you shouldn't do this. I mean, you should have backup slide. <laughs> but, uh, oh, I don't have any. Behind you is dirt. So, yeah, it was something that I was really excited about this show because it was recently when they published this that they show the now the cosmic rate density for each one. And it looks something like now ah, we saw it also in the plot, the top that uh, tiger cables. So, it's something like this. So, you have here reaching like, I don't know, probably six. Relative zero, and there is no correlation between the H1 and the star formation rate surface density for the molecular gas that goes like this. So it's like, like a flat thing. And uh, that's in terms of uh, the general thing of no, evolution. But the, the problem is that uh, H1 measurements are available only at relative 0 0.1, if I remember correctly, no. 0.1, uh, with Milka, actually. Uh, it was a recent paper, like one month ago or something, that they published these fair results. And we don't have any information for high uh, galaxies with higher rate. We can only. But then, but then you cannot say that it's that. Yeah? I mean, no, but this is using uh, different uh, techniques. Like uh, instead of looking at H1 directly, what you do is like one. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like I keep on that week, but. <laughs> That's all we can do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So direct methods. So let us go quickly. Yeah. If you put the molecular clouds, the local molecular clouds in this plot, these are high uh, above the the kinetic kind of relation. relation yeah. No? But if you put the whole Milky Way as a whole thing, it's a single point. Oh, that's a very. Do you good have question. an idea where was it for? I I haven't seen it. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think that I would do it for the next talk because I I think that it would fall outside the range that I'm plotting here. Mm -hmm. So you can see the trend that going from Reggie 2 to 0 0.3, so probably it will fall somewhere here. But that's a very good point. Thank you. Thanks. OK, we have a couple of questions on Zoom. We'll start with uh, Enrique. Uh, hi, Eric. Um, I, I have a, a very basic question. Uh, towards the beginning of your talk, you said that uh, the star formation rate in galaxies is normally correlated with their accretion rate. Uh, and so that's something that I'm getting uh, to like more and more. So, but but uh, it seems to me that uh, then you didn't talk much more about the uh, the accretion rate onto the galaxies. So, yeah. what is known about this, and how can we measure this? You you see because the people are always asking what regulates the star formation, what regulates the star formation. But there, Andy Burkert says. Uh, what regulates the star formation rate in the galaxy is the accretion rate from the extra uh, from the intergalactic medium. So, yeah. <laughs> so how, what do we know about this? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I mm -hmm. think that that's a hot topic as well because it was in uh, uh, Sebastiano Pataluco in mm -hmm. two thousand something eighteen. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the first to find evidence of uh, all streams of gas filling uh, high rate galaxies, and more recently also Emmanuel Dali and the French team. But the thing is that they can only measure the gas budget. They cannot measure the, the kinematics of the, 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 the light manner emission, actually, that mm -hmm. they observe. So that's a quite open question in extragalactic observational astronomy. And so mm -hmm. we, we don't really know. We are not at that point yet. Mm -hmm. And are there any efforts in, in trying to measure the accretion rates uh, somehow? Yeah, I mean, just, can it, okay, uh, uh, I guess it could be observable in H1 or something. How, how do you yeah. observe these inflows onto the galaxies? So, what, sorry, uh, so <laughs> what they are doing is uh, they look at the H alpha, sorry, lime and alpha emission, and they can see this in uh, using uh, how you call narrow band imaging. They can locate the lime and alpha streams, and mm -hmm. you can see the, the, the streams falling into uh, a galaxy there. 
Um, but that's all. I mean, there is no kinematical information. They can just make assumptions on the mass budget, so the amount of neutral gas that is falling, but not a rate, because you don't have the kinematical information. Uh, Seiji Fujimoto in 2019, I think, uh, he published also something similar that there was a halo around galaxies. But again, this is just like, imagine there is no kinematical information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I think that's something that we need to explore because more and more at the at the molecular cloud level, we're seeing that there's this continuous flow of material from larger yeah. scales, and uh, it might be the same type of thing for galaxies. No, so yeah. you you could be cynical and say, oh, uh, high redshift galaxies had a higher star formation rate because they had a higher accretion rate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome. But we need to 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 somehow measure that. No? Yeah, I mean, our only option, probably the best option now is Lyman Alpha, but if we focus on the low redshift regime, probably we can use uh, H1 or try to measure, but um, yeah. yeah. I think it, uh, some people also use absorption instead of emission, so they look at the bright quasar and, mm -hmm. you know, look at the, uh, at the absorption feature of H1. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you are giving me ideas. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. We have one more question from uh, Rosa. Yes. Uh, hello, Eric. Very nice talk. Thank you. I have two very naive questions. Why are galaxies smaller in the radio than in the optical? Mm -hmm. And and the other question is, um, is there any problem with the fact that NGBLA will be in the north and ALMA in the south with the different uh, beam shapes and all of that? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That, both are uh, good questions. So regarding the first one, I said like... Uh, the question that was bothering me during the, my PhD. Um, well, what we uh, propose is that they are more compact because they are, they are facing a star formation. Uh, we see that there is centrally enhanced star formation in the core. So, of course, there is more star formation in the disk, but the dominant component is the poles of a galaxy. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is that I briefly mentioned that uh, George Wolpe in, in last year, Yes, I think so. Uh, he published some numerical simulations showing the effect of those aspiration in galaxies. And what he showed is that if you have, um, just imagine a 2D profile, or well, a CES profile, <laughs> I'm not using it to very stru the structures of galaxies, but yeah, imagine a CERSKI profile. And if you have those aspiration, then what you will see in your optical image will be like a, a plateau, no? Uh, a platter in, in the center of a galaxy because you have those aspiration. And this will make the effective radius to be larger. Now, if you could, uh, correct for those aspiration, then your light profile will be uh, steeper and therefore the effective radius will be more compact. So one of the ideas is, or one of the scenarios is that we are probably not considering the effects of those aspiration and that's making the inconsistency between the radio and the optical sizes. Um, yeah. I, I heard when you said that, and I was very puzzled because yeah. I thought, well, if, if there you have dust, then you don't see things. And in radio, where you have uh, less dust, then you see smaller. But now I, I think I, I start to understand. Okay. Thank you. Ah, the, the second one? Ah, yes. Ah. About Alma and the NGVLA. Well, that's probably a question for, uh, for Eric. <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, at least for galaxies in the, uh, the equator, like uh, there, like the cosmos field, and there are many other fields that are near the equator. I think that there's there is a chance of having a large of synergies between both observatories because they would target both galaxies. Now, uh, if the beam would be relatively ugly, I don't think so. I mean, with Alma, you can observe up to 34, 35, no, uh, inclination. Uh, so, of course, you can definitely observe galaxies in the, in the equator. And with the NGVLA, that's a key motivation, and probably or, 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 or colleagues, rather, some of colleagues can uh, chime in because that's the motivation of uh, having antennas in Mexico because it will give us access to the southern sky. I mean, not the whole southern sky, but it will improve the PSF so that we can. Uh, have better imaging quality in, in galaxies in the in the equator. In the equator, they are only from both. <laughs> oh. Perfect. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. We have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Yeah, no problem. One of the first slides you mentioned with uh, gas. What is gas density? It's constant. Mm -hmm. And with stock formation density, it increases. Why? In this one, this plot? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, let me try to see if I. So the, so the question is why? The, the gas the gas efficiency is lower here. So uh, we can look at the definition of the gas of intensity, that is the amount of gas that you have divided by an area, you know, a region. So it turns out what if you have a galaxy, an extended galaxy with widespread star formation, so there is star formation almost homogeneously across the disk. And if you have a low star formation rate, so you have uh, a low number uh, here. Uh, I'm sorry, if you have a uh, low gas and then you are distributed this across a wide region, then you will be your gas surface density will be low. And the same thing for star formation rate density. Thank you. Okay, yeah, the yeah. answer to this is probably going to be yes because you addressed everything else. But uh, the gas to dust ratio, mm -hmm. we are very uncertain about it by an order of magnitude, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and also the opacity, the southern region for dust is. Like 20. That's an excellent Yeah. So, uh, where are the error bars on that? <laughs> <laughs> the error bars are contained. I mean, in these plots, uh, they are not contained because we adopted the best possible <laughs> scaling relations. So, I have forgot the name of uh, the gas to the ratio. So, it was Gensel and to, to the to it was with T something. Uh, but yeah, we, we had to use these scaling relations that they need to account the gas to the ratio and it depends on the metallicity. Mass that. Right, but even in the local universe, oh yeah, the value is extremely yes, yeah. yeah. So what we are always using is galactic average yeah. average quantities, which is based on like twenty stars. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, uh, let's all pack the speaker again. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.